Welcome in everybody to the debut episode of the Sean Miller podcast presented by Deer Park Roofing. Paul Fritchner alongside Adam Baum and of course the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller to my right. Adam, uh, this is something we're extremely excited about and this is something that fans both of Xavier and everybody across the college basketball world can be looking forward to. Yeah, I think when we came up with this idea and we got coach on board, the, the biggest things that we wanted to accomplish with this were we wanted this to be different. We wanted to highlight Sean Miller. We wanted to highlight your stories. You spent a lifetime in this game of basketball. And I feel like there's, there's a market there. People are eager to hear what you have to say. And from our perspective, you know, I think people might wonder, why did you want to do this with these two, these two guys over here? Yeah, um, <clears throat> Adam, I think from my perspective, it's number one, to have some fun. You know, I will tell you that once you get into the real games and heavy practices, all college basketball coaches, I believe, would, would sign off on this, that, you know, it, it can become one day becomes the next, and you, you win and lose and the emotions of it. Next thing you know, just three months go by, and you, you, didn't, you almost forgot that there is a life besides the, the game, the team, et cetera. And I think this – gives me the opportunity to talk about a game that I love, uh, a city in particular, Cincinnati, and a place, Xavier, both as a university and a basketball program. That means a lot to me, and we could do it in more of a, a fun, lighthearted way. Sean, you've spent your life around this game, around basketball. It's given a lot to you. What drew you to it originally? And go all the way back. Go back to the very beginning and your roots in this game. Well, for me, it started with my dad. Um, he was a high school coach for uh, almost 40 years in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, the places that he coached, you know, you're not able to recruit. So he had to develop players through an elementary program, a junior high program, hire his coaches. And what he did is he built one of the best basketball programs in the state of Pennsylvania in Blackhawk High School. Growing up in that house, uh, there weren't too many conversations that my two sisters, my younger brother, Arch, who you guys know, and myself would have had that wouldn't have centered around basketball at some level, right? And uh, because of that, I think I was drawn to the game at an early age. And the other part for my dad is he was also an excellent teacher. Like he could really teach the fundamentals of the game and uh, being his son led me to this game. Yeah, I think most kids, you get into a sport when you're young and it's really easy to get hooked. And then it's kind of a different story when you start thinking about, oh, I think I want to try to play this in college and take it to the next level. What was that process like for you in that recruiting process? Um, I think you actually, you, you went on a recruiting visit to Providence when Rick Pitino was the head coach. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I started playing a game when I was really young. You know, a lot of people remember I would do halftime shows and different things as far back as when I was nine years old, 10 years old. How that happened was simply back then there were no baskets lower than 10 feet. So if you were in the gym constantly, what did you do with the basketball? You learned how to dribble, you know, back to my dad being a great teacher. But I didn't want to be known as a showman. And, you know, I didn't really grow until about my 11th grade year. And in some ways, I became a late bloomer as a player. But when I hit the 11th grade summer before my senior year, I started to be recruited at a pretty high level. Uh, Pitt at that time was in the Big East Conference. Uh, they were a rising power. Uh, Providence was coached by Rick Pitino, Virginia, Terry Holland. And then there was just other schools that, you know, you always wanted to go to when you were a young kid. For me, it was Carolina, Dean Smith. Uh, but anyway, it came down to my final three schools were Virginia, Pitt, and Providence, and I made the three official visits. Uh, I really, in some ways, maybe it's because I'm a coach, Adam, but I could probably tell you about all three visits. You know, that's, that's how memorable they are in my mind, going back to 1987. But when I visited Providence, it was new because Coach Patino, and ironically, he's the coach at St. John's today, you know, he was one of the game's best. An amazing teacher, a lot like my dad, was revolutionizing the three-point shot and introducing it in a different way to college basketball. And he had a guard on his team who really I admired, Billy Donovan. 
I looked at myself as a version of Billy and if I was going to be successful in college, I had to follow a path like Billy Donovan blazed. So when I visited Providence, Billy Donovan was my host and we went up there and I visited with uh, a number of other good high school players at different positions. But Coach Patino back then, and maybe he does it the same today, I don't know, he had a different philosophy than the other two visits. And that is, he truly wanted to show you how much you were gonna practice, how hard you were going to work, and how much they loved the game at Providence. And sure enough, like that resonated with me uh, to the point where you know, it really almost scared me to death. We watched the practice maybe at nine in the morning, maybe a player development practice, we came back in the afternoon and I watched them press for about two hours. That was the second practice. And then we got to the third practice and they went harder in the third practice than they did in the first and the second one. And I remember being on the visit with a couple of the guys and uh, them looking at me saying like, man, I don't know if I could come here and practice this much. And here I was, Mr. You know, have a ball in his hand, son of a high school coach. You know, this is what you're gonna sign up for. You gotta be super excited. It actually frightened me. I didn't know if I could run that much, you know, as I watched these guys. But uh, Billy was my host. At the end of the day, I ended up choosing Pitt, and I'm glad I did. And it just goes to show that, you know, on a visit, a lot of different emotions could happen. When I visited Virginia, I really loved Virginia. They were in the ACC, and I, I loved the coaching staff. They recruited me very hard. Uh, I wasn't that far from Pittsburgh where I grew up. And I went to a football game, and the student body wear, would wear a tie to the game. I think they still do it. So even if you had a T-shirt on, you wore an orange or a blue tie. Me being from Pittsburgh, you know, Steelers fan and watching football, like, that scared me. You know, more than anything <laughs> I remember on the visit, I remember thinking, like, I don't know if that fits me. At Providence, I loved Coach Patino. I loved Billy Donovan. But I was like, man, I, I honestly don't know if I could. I think my body will break down. Pitt was the sweet spot. Home, uh, John Calipari was the assistant recruiting. I loved him. Um, Big East Conference. And I, I went with my gut there. Glad I did. What do you remember from your time, you know, looking back and now, of course, Rick Pitino being in the Big East Conference, going to have to coach him against him this year and all this history with Rick. What do you remember that he talked about on that visit with you that maybe you could joke about now or that you might see him on the sideline and, and talk about now that your relationship has grown to the point where you're coaching against each other? I'm sure he doesn't realize it at this point or even remember because he's coached so many great players and has had so many visits over his you know, amazing career. But the thing that always stood out for me with him is just, again, how, how great of a teacher he was and the passion that he had to make his individual players better. I still believe that he has that at St. John's. It's one of one of the things that we all have to make sure that we do a great job of in the same conference that he's now coaching in. But if you followed his track record, he hasn't always had the high school McDonald's All-American or the most talented roster. He really hasn't. But regardless of who he who he had on his roster, it just seems like they improve. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with he himself, the tone he sets about player development. And that's something that at 18 years old, I still remember. And as a coach, I really took with me both from him on that weekend visit, other coaches, but certainly my dad. Like As much as this is a team sport, the thing that can never be understated is how important it is for you to connect with and improve the individual players that you coach and are responsible for. The Sean Miller Podcast is brought to you by our trusted friends at Deer Park Roofing. Protect what's important with Deer Park Roofing's industry-leading training, expert attention to detail, and responsive service. From commercial and residential roof replacements to roof repairs, gutters, and more. Request a free estimate today at DeerParkRoofing.com. Sean, you mentioned... You know, you really wanted to play for, for Dean Smith in North Carolina. Is that a situation where you wish that a school like that might have recruited you a little bit harder than they did? Well, growing up, that was my passion. I, I mean, I, I worked every day to be the point guard in North Carolina. That was my dream. Uh, you know, my dad loved Dean Smith. Uh, again, back to 
you, when your dad's a high school coach like like my dad was, it's amazing the gifts that you receive, you know. And you know he would talk all the time about if you if you're going to, going to be recruited by them, you got to be the best. They're not going to recruit you if you're not. And they recruited me for a while, but at the end of the day, they didn't offer me a scholarship. I believe King Rice, who's a coach at Monmouth, would have been the, the player in my class that went to North Carolina. He was really, really good. But it's a story that I remember and I think about when I recruit now, our staff recruits, and a lot of the young people that I do. You know, what's the reaction when you show up recruiting them? Do they seem excited? Uh, are they out of character? Are they too nonchalant? You know, well, they run through a door simply because you're in the stands, right? And I was at five-star basketball camp in Virginia going into my senior year, very, very hot outside. Again, blacktop, that's how the camp was back then. And uh, it was an open recruiting period. And I always was keeping track. Is anybody watching my game, right? All kids do that. And the school that I kept wanting to come and watch was North Carolina. And sure enough, they did. And looking at the game, I remember looking and saying, are they here to see anybody else? Nope, I think it's me. <laughs> and it was Roy Williams, who at the time was uh, Dean Smith assistant coach. And I've actually talked to Coach Williams about this years and years ago. I'm not sure if he remembered or not. <laughs> I do. And uh, he was watching me, and I remember saying, like, God, I will do anything to get a scholarship to North Carolina. A loose ball, blacktop, I dove, bleeding, thinking that would help. You know, trying to make the clever pass, make the shot as the wind was blowing on an outdoor court, all the different things. Probably putting the pressure of the world on my shoulders just to make sure that I was at my best. And I remember just playing, playing, trying not to glance. And as I glanced over, maybe about a quarter and a half through, he left. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I'm not going to North Carolina. <laughs> you know, I don't think I got his attention long enough. And sure enough, you know, they obviously didn't recruit me. But it's a story that you remember now because, you know, you're always aware of how you felt when that dream school, that really important program came to watch you. And when I'm on the other side of it now, you know, every once in a while, if you see a kid disengaged, it's something you have to pay attention to because more than likely he's telling you what you need to know. What are some of the things that you tell your staff like that when you talk about a story like that and you want maybe a new staff, if you're building a new staff, you come to Xavier and you're, you're getting your guys that you want to go out there and recruit and find your next round of talent. You tell that story, what's their reaction and, and what do you hope they get from that? So when I was at Arizona, we had a football coach, Rich Rodriguez. You guys would have remembered him as much coaching West Virginia and Michigan. And he became a friend of mine. And I loved the way that he coached because you know, Rich's philosophy recruiting, especially at West Virginia and Arizona, was he wasn't going to be able to get the high school All-American. And what he tried to get is what he called OKGs. And it, 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 the abbreviation is our kind of guys. And what it meant is, you know, in his offensive system, if you follow him, he loves the small, quick guys that if you get them the ball in space, they can run for an 80-yard touchdown. Uh, defensive lineman, he wasn't trying to get the biggest, strongest, but he wanted quick defensive linemen. And he really had it wired so that everybody on his staff would identify these are the types of players that fit us and the characteristics that allow them to be successful. You know, if you put that spin to basketball, you know, I think especially here at Xavier, we want people and players that love the game. I've never seen a player improve, back to Coach Patino's story, it's hard to go to Providence unless you just really loved it. And if you didn't love it, it would be hard to survive that environment where basketball was so important. And I think when you look at us here at Xavier, those that continue to develop, that can fight through the adversity and obstacles, usually have a passion and love of the game that's deep. And they're willing to go the extra mile they're willing to put that extra hard work in. You know, back to my story about Providence, it wasn't that I didn't love the game or that scared me. I just could not believe the workload that those guys put in one day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're 18 years old, it was an impression that was more like, wow, I've never seen guys work like this before. And, I, I've, again, I've carried that with me 
uh, until today as, as a coach. But so the OKG is something that, that I think every staff that I've been a part of, I try to keep in mind. You know, great example of if you really are trying to get somebody to come to our program who rebounds the ball, why would you ever ignore how many rebounds he gets in high school? If a guy is getting five rebounds a game in high school and he's six nine and he jumps to the gym, what makes you think that you can make him rebound better than the five that he got in high school? Like that's something that really translates. So another characteristic of an our kind of guy is he produces where he's at. Not that he can't go from 12 points a game to 16 or incrementally get better at what he does, but if you're bringing him in here to be in a rebounder, you want him to rebound at the place he's already at, then make him better. Great example is David West. Another great example is Tyrone Hill. If you track those two guys, I don't care what game they played at before they came to Xavier, I guarantee you they were one of the best rebounders in the game. And then here, what did they do? They became one of the nation's best. And you, you talk about recruiting, and I think it's one thing to be recruited it's another thing to you know sign a letter of intent and say, hey, I'm going to go be a Division One college basketball player. And a lot of your guys on your current team are going through this right now. You got a lot of freshmen. What did you have to overcome doubt? How how do you get through that when you're a freshman and you're wondering, can I play at this level? Am I am I capable? Do I belong here? Yeah, I mean that's that's his, that's the most difficult part of the transition, Adam, and. You know, I don't care if, if you go on to be the Big East freshman of the year. You'll always be able to recall a period of time when you first got to the university that you chose from high school where it just felt different. It, it just, wow. And it should, right? You went from the oldest, the biggest, the best, at most of the time a place that only has one Division One player, sometimes maybe a couple if you're lucky, to – a program in college that has guys aspiring to be NBA players. When I left Blackhawk High School and went to Pitt, we went had Charles Smith, Jerome Lane, and Demetrius Gore, all in their junior and senior years. Charles was, I think, the number two or three pick in the NBA draft that year. Jerome was number 18. Demetrius Gore could have played in the NBA for many, many years. So you walk into that pickup game in early June, coming from Blackhawk High School, I mean, there are times when you just have this doubt and you lose your confidence. They make you lose your confidence because of how talented they are. So you're reliant on a coach, your parents, your high school coach, to encourage you and help you through that, that hard time. In the freshman year at Pitt, and I became the Big East Freshman of the Year. So I wasn't a bum in my freshman year. I mean, I, I did it. But there was a time in mid-October, we had been practicing for about three or four weeks. And again, I had a lot of doubt from the summer months playing pickup. And I don't know if I could play at Pitt. And I remember having conversations with my dad. He encouraged me, but he wasn't there. The person that was there was an assistant coach, and his name was John Calipari. And he recruited me, recruited a lot of us that were on the team. I came in with a great recruiting class. We might have had the number one recruiting class in the country. I was a part of that class. And I was having bad practice after bad practice after work after, I mean, nothing was going right for me. I felt it. My teammates felt it. Uh, I had no confidence. And Calipari called me into his office. And the conversation, conversation went something like that. I actually just was with him a couple of days ago, and, and me and him were talking about that very conversation. He called me in his office, and he said, look, if I would have known you were going to be soft and scared, I never would have recruited you to this place. I mean, you knew this was the Big East. You knew we had a really good team. And you also knew we're counting on you to be a good player. We had choices, and I've put my neck on the line and my name on the line to say that you were tough enough, good enough, and you you were the answer. Right now, you don't have to be a great player, but like you just you're you're like scared, like you don't want to make a mistake. And we had a staff meeting earlier today. I want you to know you're now the third string point guard. I'm embarrassed for you. 
But I'm going to tell you, like, you got choices. You're either going to start fighting and you're not going to worry about people's feelings and what you just did, or you're going to start playing because you can do it. And that was the first time anyone really had talked to me like that. Uh, my dad's one thing. He could talk to me however he wants, <laughs> but no one has ever really hit me between the eyes like he did. And it might have been later that afternoon or the next day. I, I almost had like a zombie approach to it and just said, you know what, he's right. You know, next guy who cuts down the lane, I'm going to hit and dive on the floor. I'm going to be that guy. I, I can do that. I can at least play hard and compete fearlessly. And really that's what I did. I think it was the next drill and one of the walk-ons probably cut and I hit him as hard as I could. And I remember the guy's like, what was that about? And the rest of the practice, I just played with a different mentality and mindset. And it wasn't like it fixed everything, but I think it was the first lesson for me in sports. Your mindset and competitive spirit and will and toughness can really take you a long way. And you could be really talented, but if you have none of that, you have no chance. Right now with our six freshmen that we have here at Xavier, there's a version of that talk that's going on at different times this fall. Because like I mentioned, each one of them is improving and developing, but they're all going to need a reminder that this is not high school anymore. Because in our case this year, based on our numbers, we're really depending on our freshman class to do a great job for us. And it's funny that I would rely on a message as far back as you know the, the questions you guys are asking me. That's like, man, that's in the late 80s, you know? <laughs> but you remember it because it, it's so impressionable on you at that point in your life. The Sean Miller Podcast is brought to you by Deer Park Roofing, and their company motto is protect what's important. Deer Park is not just another storm-chasing roofing company. They are invested in your community and truly care about the people in it. You can trust them to do the job right. Deer Park has highly trained professional technicians who make sure your residential or commercial roofing system is installed correctly and quickly. For a free estimate, visit DeerParkRoofing.com today. That's DeerParkRoofing.com. Sean, as your playing career is winding down, what was your mentality about trying to play professionally or was it just I know I want to get into coaching let's get that journey started as quickly as possible yeah so back then when you were a senior and most of us were very few guys left early for the NBA even the best of the best you hope to get invited to Portsmouth it's called the PIT and the graduating players from college all went down to Portsmouth Virginia played in various high school gyms in front of the entire NBA they put you on teams. You played, in essence, three games in three days. You were interviewed. If you had an agent, your agent went down there with you. PIT still exists. It's much different today because of all the underclassmen and international players that are in the NBA draft. But back then, it was a big deal. So the season ended. I got invited to, to Portsmouth. And I remember thinking, I kind of hope I don't get invited to Portsmouth because I've played enough basketball for three lives. <laughs> and I really mean it. Like, I wouldn't say I was burned out as much as I had given my heart and soul to the sport. And deep down, I wondered if I could run fast enough and back then physically be able to, to get the benefit of the doubt to be an NBA player. Most guards in the league back then were huge, 6'4", great athletes. You know, Derek Harper, if you remember him, or Dennis Johnson played for the Celtics. Think about how big and strong they were, right? Mark Jackson. And then those that weren't were Superman, D. Brown, Mookie Blaylock, guys like that. So I went to Portsmouth, and I remember saying, I'm going to work hard. Let's see what happens. But at the end of the day, I had a passion to restart and take a work ethic and a love for this sport and say, if I was judged not on how quick I was, how far could I go? What could I do? How much would I enjoy it? Because you just get tired of hearing you're not quick enough. Um, coaching represented that for me, where I could take my knowledge and love for the sport and work ethic and not be judged on how fast I was. So in some ways, I really wanted to get in coaching. So I went to Portsmouth. My plan was play three games. We'll see. If they want me to go to Europe, I'm not going. 
I'm going to get started in coaching. The problem was there was no graduate assistance in the year that I was graduating from college. The NCAA did away with that, and they created this position called a restricted earnings coach. So in some ways, I didn't know if there would be an opportunity for me to go to college. So I applied for a high school coaching job in Pittsburgh, Keystone Oaks High School, graduated from Pitt, and now I'm going to Portsmouth to see where we go. I went down there, first game okay, second game really good, and then the third game I played great. As a matter of fact, it was like, wow, maybe, maybe I can do it. But I had a roommate, and the way it works at Portsmouth is if somebody wants to connect with you, your agent or that team called your room. And like I said, I played mediocre, I played good, I played great in my mind. I never got a call. I kept answering the phone. It was always for him. <laughs> so in some ways, I, have, I figured right there, like, I'm not going to make it, and that's fine. So I played Portsmouth. That's how it ended. I was really the last basketball game of meaning that I ever played. I really mean it. Like, a few pickup games here and there, but for the most part, like I said, I had played so much, I was looking forward to a new challenge. And thankfully, and I'll go back to my recruiting visit at Providence, Head coach is Rick Pitino. One assistant was Herb Sendek. One assistant was Stu Jackson. A graduate assistant was Jeff Van Gundy. So my first job and my way to get into coaching was Stu Jackson was named the head coach at the University of Wisconsin. He wanted a young player as his restricted earnings coach, a young person that could do, really get on the court with the guys. Uh, he gave me that opportunity. I'm forever grateful. And I worked with Stan Van Gundy, Jeff Van Gundy's brother, and Stu. And that was it. I entered in the Big Ten as the restricted earnings coach, uh, made $12,000, was thrilled. And that was in 1992. And here I am today. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think, you know, listening to you talk about essentially your whole life in basketball I think this is a question that I've become accustomed to asking I'm always curious when I meet someone who's very who found the thing that they want to do with the rest of their life when they're young do you ever wonder what your life might have looked like if it weren't for basketball if you never found the game if your dad wasn't a coach what what do you think Sean Miller would be doing right here right now today if not for basketball you know, I, I don't know. I, I did get the answer to that because a couple of years ago when I wasn't a coach, I wasn't on a team, and I, for the first time since that Portsmouth and entry into the University of Wisconsin basketball, I didn't have to do anything. Yeah. When you grow up the way I grew up, and you, and you to answer the questions like I have, I almost can't give you an answer to the next question because I only know one thing. And that's also what I learned a couple years ago, that you can get beaten down with some of the, the tough things that can accompany the industry of college sports. You could lose your job. You could have a losing season. You could have a star player get injured, and on that particular day, it just seems like the world is going to end. But at the end of the day, I think the best people in life that, that, that are in an industry that, that really rise to the top of that industry or, or do it for a lifetime, it's more of a passion for them than a job. It's not something they have to do. Deep down, it's something they love to do. And in the year off two years ago for me, that was my awakening. I realized the answer to your question is, I don't know. So it dials back to you really understand like this sport is something that's given me a lot i've also given my heart and soul to it i know no other way but at the end of the day i really love it i really do i love it love everything about it and that really fueled me to want to somehow some way get back into it at another opportunity and when this opportunity presented itself it was like oh my god here we go, you know, so yeah. that's the answer. 
Well, Sean, thanks so much. I, Adam and I are so looking forward to this process with you and to do this show. And this is something we've been very excited about for the last couple of months, getting this off the ground and giving you an opportunity to show your personality, share your stories and bring on some people from around the college basketball world that we're very much looking forward to talking to. So thanks so much for this. I, this has been fantastic. No, I know I'm equally looking forward to it. I know, number one, both of you guys are incredibly knowledgeable about the sport knowledgeable about Xavier basketball, which includes the Big East Conference, and the Crosstown Shootout, and the history and tradition, and somewhat, you know, the, the underrated history and tradition of our, our basketball program. So I'm looking forward to, to really bringing that to life. And, you know, the last time I was on a podcast, you know, having back problems was easy. It became a part of it because, you know, I'm carrying guys. You know, I'm carrying my brother. I'm carrying <laughs> Jeff Goodman. <laughs> Lord knows I had to carry Fanta. I mean, that, that was a tall, uh, a true, uh, I mean, a real tall task right there. Yeah. Uh, you know, all those guys. So, you know, I felt like I had to do it by myself and overcome <laughs> a lot of their inadequacies and just generally, you know, make the shot, score the points, you know, carry the team. So yeah. finally, I feel like I have more balanced approach with this group and I'm looking forward to to having, a, having that where we can share in, in the workload. I agree. We appreciate that you believe in us, Coach. <laughs> uh, good. Thanks, good. And if we can just do better than Fanta, I consider this a raging success. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be hard, that's for sure. <laughs> well, Coach, thanks so much. Adam, it's, this has been great. And for everybody watching and listening, you can subscribe to this podcast on all podcast platforms. That includes Apple, Spotify, all the big podcast platforms and all the other ones too. It'll be available all through there. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube at Sean Miller Pod. That is where uh, you can find us on YouTube. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, go ahead and make sure that you follow us on social media, Twitter, or I guess x.com now. Good That's branding, x.com. Yeah. Uh, x.com now and uh, Instagram, TikTok, all over there. We'll be posting not only this show, but also clips from the show, highlights from the show, things that Maybe outside the show, if we do other content, Adam and I will be will be doing content all season long. Um, so we'll have all those things for all of you that watch and listen to this. So we want to thank each and every one of you. We also want to make sure that we thank Deer Park Roofing, who this show is presented to you by. So thanks to Deer Park Roofing, and thanks to all of you watching this, and we're looking forward to it. Thanks again, Coach. Thank you.